Hey everyone, as promised, I'm back for another little uh, lecture video from uh, this weekend. Um, the way our schedule is set up, I just wanted to kind of set ourselves up for as much success as possible with getting uh, the lectures for the chapter 8, 9, 10 knocked out as soon as possible so you have even more time for uh, reviewing and taking exam 2 um, before the end of the quarter. Uh, I sent out a big weekend update email uh, earlier today, uh, and as I put in the subject line, please do not ignore it, please check it out. Uh, I'm trying to lay out the schedule for the entire rest of the quarter for you so you know what to expect. Um, and as the, the way I've designed the class, uh, which is even more useful during summer, um, exams one and two are really the doozies. Those are the big ones. Um, so you'll have those both done before the end of the quarter, um, and our last little unit will like land the plane a little more softly. But I want to make sure we have uh, enough time to do everything, or at least the most comfortable amount of time. So I'm throwing in this little bonus lecture on the Chapter 9 material, on SCT and NCT, the sufficient condition test and the necessary condition test, which is going to get us into causal reasoning. Um, I thought I'd just knock out this video uh, quickly this weekend for you. Um, I don't think this video is going to be too long. Um, the SCT and NCT are actually pretty straightforward, ultimately, uh, especially if the whole formal logic unit has been going well for you, then um, you're not going to see anything here that's really unfamiliar. Um, in fact, I'm going to lean on a little bit of the formal logic unit to help us understand this. I, I, I as as happened a few times this quarter, um, there are a few things in the in the class that I think I've got some better ways of teaching than the way the textbook does, or I've been able to improve on the textbook's uh, techniques a little bit, and that's definitely going to be present here. And the formal logic stuff actually I think is is going to give us the material to do that. But before we go any further here, um, let's just set the backdrop for this technique. Why are we why are we caring to learn the SCT, NCT, and all that kind of stuff? I mentioned at the beginning of this unit um, in my last lecture that uh, the SCT, NCT stuff will probably look somewhat familiar to you as uh, a representation of how. Um, most of us understand the way the scientific method works. That you make a hypothesis, you design an experiment to test that hypothesis, you conduct the experiment, you analyze the results, and see if that confirms or disconfirms the hypothesis. That's basically what we're going to be doing with SCT and NCT here. It's like, how do you take a set of observations and analyze them to find what they're telling you about the causal laws of the universe, the sort of patterns about how things happen in the causal nexus of our world. Um, so uh, that's that that if that looks like something familiar to you, uh, that's what we're going to be doing here. But there's actually a whole lot of this style of reasoning um, that we're not going to be going into. We're going to be focusing on just a kind of bare bones core to it. Um, I've got some stuff already prepared here on our whiteboard. Um, I have this little argument form, and this is uh, a representation of how our causal reasoning functions logically. Um, if I want to draw some kind of conclusion about some matter of fact, oh boy, I cannot draw <laughs> with the mouse. Uh, if I, w I have to go slow here. If I want to draw some conclusion about some matter of fact, uh, either something I want to... Uh, predict or as a kind of explanation, those are kind of the two core functions of causal reasoning, to make predictions uh, or to explain what has happened. And either way, if I'm trying to do that, I'm going to be relying on some other observations coupled with the causal laws, the sort of rules about how things work causally in the universe in order to generate this conclusion. So let, let's do a quick example. It, prediction is really I think the most accessible one here. So I've got some observations like, uh, I don't know, um, <laughs> this happens a lot with my toddler. I'm looking at my toddler's behavior. I know some causal laws of human physiology and maybe some physical laws like gravity. And then I draw a conclusion or a prediction about the impending mess that is about to occur. 
or how he's going to fall down or something like that, right? I, I have to know something about the situation in terms of its particular facts. And then I've got these generalized patterns for how things work. And that allows me to draw a conclusion about what's going to happen. So what we're going to be focusing on in these kinds of... There's, there's a lot to say about these forms of reasoning. Um, and stuff that's like available for in, inductive evaluation. But we're going to focus mostly on... How do we know these causal laws? Where do we get those from? That's what chapter 9 is really devoted to. There's a lot of other questions here to be had. And in fact, philosophy of science is devoted largely to unpacking those kinds of questions. Um, this form of reasoning seems to be sort of paradigmatic for scientific reasoning, um, scientific investigation. And philosophy of science is trying to figure out what exactly is that. And if that seems like a strange question to ask to you, um, I do actually have, a, a, I'm going to take a slight tangent here to back that up a little bit. So I might have even mentioned this, this work before. If you're curious, I can give it to you. There's this awesome study that was done by a philosopher of science where he took something like 75 different science textbooks for college level classes taken from a wide variety of disciplines. Um, everything from physics to chemistry to biology to natural history to psychology to like the whole gamut and uh, and he analyzed them for how those textbooks present what the scientific method is and how it sort of answers some of the fundamental questions that philosophers of science uh, investigate and argue and debate and you know the I think the intuition here the prediction would be that you know it'd be pretty basic stuff and it'd be all everyone would be on the same page about like what is the scientific method or how does scientific reasoning work or like what are what are the methodologies here what are the techniques and uh, surprise surprise the textbooks do not line up they directly contradict each other there's a lot of tension with how they present things even when they're aware of what the some of the options are they frame those in drastically different ways um, there's a lot of dismissing of certain positions about the other ones that are like they're all kind of talking when they do when they are aware of the other sorts of options there they're very dismissive of the other ones so they all end up like dismissing each other um, the short of it is that there isn't consensus the one common variable is that each textbook presents its version of the scientific method as the default one that everyone of course agrees to so it's kind of it's a fun paper uh, to read and, and to kind of see uh, how there really is some work here for philosophers to do, which was kind of the point of his paper. He was like, when people dismiss uh, philosophy of science as like unnecessary or something, that w it's only dealing with these little minor hair-splitting theoretical distinctions, that it's actually addressing the most basic things that there isn't agreement on among scientists. So if you want that paper, I'd be happy to give it to you. Just send me an email and I can forward it along. I've got a copy lurking somewhere on my computer. Um, so there's a lot of other questions here that can be and should be asked about the way in which scientific causal reasoning occurs and how these arguments function. Um, philosophers have been weighing in on this since the beginning of modern science because they're really responsible for modern science, in the, at least in the Western world and in the Eastern world too. I mean, they, the people who developed this were also themselves philosophers. Um, uh, so there, there's cool stuff there. Uh, but we're going to focus on the low-hanging fruit. And I know I just talked about a scenario where this is presented as obvious and it really isn't obvious. But among the people who are studying these controversies the most, there is one thing that we're on the same page about. So let me, that's why I got this other drawing here. So what is a cause is one of these things that um, philosophers of science spend a lot of time debating. And it's pretty fuzzy. And even in the text that you read, it gets a little bit into these fuzzinesses. Like, what are all the conditions, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for causing, calling something a cause, like defining it? Well, it's pretty fuzzy. There, we, we don't have this pinned down in an uncontroversial way. However, we do have this pinned down, that at the root of whatever is a cause is some kind of conditional relationship, some relationship between states of affairs in a kind of hypothetical way, in the way that conditionals talk about. So whatever a cause is, or whatever a causal law has going on, at least part of that meaning is going to be 
this idea of something being a necessary or sufficient condition for something else. Now there's probably going to be a lot of other conditions needed before we pick out and call something a cause, but this is, uh, so th there's more here to this territory, but at the very least it's going to have this. And this we can study, this we can test, this we can investigate, and that's what the SCT and NCT uh, tests are for, is to basically figure out whether these relationships hold. So I can, I can draw another argument here. We're going to have a set of observations. So if we want to know how the world works, we're going to have to take a look at it. We can't just do this in the armchair. Um, and on the basis of those observations, coupled with, I'm just going to call it the method of SCT, NCT, we can draw a conclusion about whether something is a sufficient or necessary condition for something else. And remember again, um, we have uh, this sun principle, right? So when I've got a conditional like this one here, I'm just going to copy and paste this so I don't have to type it again. When I got this, I remember this is telling me a few different things. So it's telling me that P is sufficient for Q, and it's also telling me that Q is necessary for P. Both, both pieces of information are you could sort of think of as embedded within this conditional. <clears throat> these really mean the same thing. So figuring out whether one of these conditional relationships holds is a matter of making, running some experiments, having some observations, a, a set of data, and then analyzing it using the methods of the SCT and the NCT. And that might put us in a position to draw this conclusion that something is sufficient for something else or something is necessary for something else. And that's something that is a minimal bar here that's going to have to be passed before we can say there is a cause here. There's a causal pattern, a causal law of some kind. So that's what we're up to. Now, this type of argument is not deductive and never could be. <laughs> this, is, this is part of what we were talking about in earlier lectures about how science is all inductive. The SCT and NCT will never be able to conclusively prove that something is sufficient for something else or something is necessary for something else. It'll never be able to do that. But it will start adding evidence, right? And the more observations we make that we run through this technique, um, the better evidence we have, the stronger support we have for drawing this causal conclusion to say there is a causal pattern here. We can never definitively prove these things. Science is always fallible, like we've talked about before. Um, but we can do something here. We can provide some kind of rational basis for why we would draw this belief. And just like all inductive arguments, it can be stronger and it can be weaker, right? It's on a spectrum. Um, but we can identify the pattern by which these arguments become stronger and become weaker. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. Um, let's erase all this. Whoop. And let's, I'm actually going to pull up the homework right away. We're going to look at this homework right away. Um, and let's see if it'll let me, uh, let's not do that one. Let's do, let's do this one. Can I copy and paste this? Copy. Okay, I'm going to pause the video. Sometimes I have trouble with this. Okay, this is a little less than perfect, but uh, here we can go with this. So this was taken off of the homework for uh, Chapter 9. Um, there's two types of homework problems here. There are these A, B, C, D, G ones, and then there is this uh, word problem with the trying to diagnose, like, what went wrong with computers uh, in an office. Um, you're going to see both kinds of problems on the exam for this section, and I'm going to give different instructions for both. The um, instructions for this homework, I believe, alert you to this, and they tell you what's up. Sorry about that, I had to sneeze, and while well, I paused the video, I just took the liberty of pulling up the instructions here. Here's the chapter 9. There's actually three exercises. I'm sorry, I lied. Uh, this first one is just testing your conceptual understanding, kind of like when you had to test uh, to understand validity before. Um, but these are the two big ones. So three and four here. This is three and this one's four. Um, so as I say here in the instructions, ignore the instructions in the book. 
and use these instructions again because this is how it's going to look on the exam. So, uh, and, and it boils down to either telling me about what fails the sufficient condition test and fails the necessary condition test versus what passes this, the test, uh, each, either one of those tests. So SCT and NCT are going to be ways of testing hypotheses against some data, the observations from experiments, this kind of thing. And sometimes a hypothesis might pass the test, and sometimes it might fail the test. And I want you to be able to do both things, to talk about both things, to demonstrate your like kind of full understanding of these tests and how they work. So the instructions, that's just an important heads up. The instructions are different from how they're worded here. I want you to do them differently than how they're worded in the text. Uh, just like always, follow the instructions I put in that instructions document. But what these are kind of giving you, this one in an abstract way, this one in a not abstract way, they're presenting a situation where you've got a set of cases, like circumstances that you observed, and you determined that those cases had certain properties or not. And, and in this case, I like uh, kind of putting some meat on the bones here. So let's, let's pretend, uh, let's make this a little, sorry, this is so pixelated but I think it's still legible here. Um, let's make this a little interesting. So let's say I'm trying to figure out, uh, I'm, I'm new to gardening, and I'm trying to figure out how to be a good gardener. I want to have an urban, let's say, herb garden or something in my apartment. Uh, we actually do have a garden out there, but uh, and I kind of know what I'm doing at this point. But let's say I was just starting out, and instead of looking on the Internet, I'm like, no, nope, you know what? I also want to use this as an opportunity to be a little scientist myself because, you know, who knows? Different part of the world, different part of the country, my conditions might be different than what advice I would get someplace else. Whatever is a reason, let's just say I want to figure this out for myself. Maybe I'm on a desert island or something and I'm trying to get plants to grow so I can eat and I don't have the internet. So there's always going to be some target condition. that I'm aiming at. I want to understand what is sufficient or necessary for something and that's going to be the target. And in these problems the target is identified as feature G. And in our little thought experiment here let's make G just stand for uh, plants are growing. So the plants, I, I set up three different gardens here and in each garden they've got different conditions in case one and case three, the plants are growing. In case two, they're not. Okay, so these other four variables A, B, C, and D, these are going to be the candidate. Ugh. Oh my gosh, the candidate conditions. And the candidate conditions are the things that might be sufficient or necessary for the target condition. So in this case, our candidates are A, B, C, and D. And there might be more. Okay, And uh, I don't know, just to put some flesh on the bones here, let's say A is I water the plants, uh, B is I give them fertilizer, let's say C is I sing to them, and... Uh, Let's say D is I put uh, Skittles in the soil. Let's say I do that. So they're a little goofy here, but I'm, I'm just making this up. All right. So I try out all these different gardens under different conditions. So case one and three, I water them. Case two, I don't. In case one and two, I give them fertilizer, but in case three, I don't. Uh, in case one and three, I sing to them. In case two, I don't. And in case one and two, I give them Skittles, but I don't give them any Skittles in case three. Okay, so this is just like the data. This might look a lot like logic, but in logic, when we are setting up the conditions, we want to cover all the logically possible options. When you're doing SCT and NCT, you're still comparing hypotheses here against the facts of how the world is. And the world isn't, doesn't always manifest every single logical possibility, right? The world is one way rather than another way. Uh, we talked about understanding logical possibilities as like other ways the world could have been, counterfactual possibilities, right? That can happen too. So 
like possible worlds kind of thing. So causal reasoning is, is not like we have to cover all of our bases. All we need to cover is what are the actual facts, like what's actually happened under these different scenarios, because we're trying to figure out what is that shape of how the world is as opposed to how it's not, right? Which of the logical possibilities is the actual world is what we're trying to figure out now. It's, a, it's definitely a different game than, than what we're doing with logic. So these are the facts, and maybe if I had another garden, I'd get some different results, but we always have to work with the evidence we got. And that's one reason why SCT and NCT is always going to be fallible here. Uh, we're never going to get a definitive answer because there's always another case that might show something different, right? And that's what happens in the history of science too, right? We think we've got it covered, you know, all the things we've been able to observe. There's some consistent patterns here, uh, but then something new shows up and it just blows that all, up, all out of the water. So um, fallible, but again, something gets us something. So going to the next step here for the explanation of what's going on. What we want to test are hypotheses. Something like maybe B is sufficient for G, for the target case, right? Or D is necessary for G. We want to test these sorts of things. And what the SCT and NCT tell us is how to test these hypotheses against the data we collected. That's what it does for us. Okay, so let's talk about how this works a little bit in detail. So I want to test all these different candidate conditions to see whether they are necessary or sufficient for our target condition. Um, all right, I want to make sure I have enough space in my whiteboard here. So first up, let's cover the SCT. So what the SCT does for us is allow us to test hypotheses of the form um, some candidate. Oh, I misspelled candidate up here. Gosh. <laughs> here, I was going to bother. I'm just going to. Oh, my gosh. I can't talk and think and spell at the same time. Good thing I'm not an English teacher. Okay. <laughs> now that that's fixed. So what does the SCT let us do? SCT allows us to test hypotheses of the form some candidate <laughs> feature is sufficient for a target feature. Okay. So I want to know, is this a true statement or not? Now, sufficient and necessary condition claims are conditional statements. Um, they're talking about how different states of affairs are related to each other. In this case, we're wondering about watering plants, fertilizing plants, singing to plants, and skittles, putting skittles in the soil, how those things may or may not be linked hypothetically uh, in hypothetical situations with this phenomenon of the plants growing. That's what we're trying to figure out. And in order to test this, to figure out, like, does this hypothesis uh, get disconfirmed or confirmed by the experimental data or observations we've collected, uh, logic is going to be a little helpful here because logic can tell us what are the truth conditions for this statement. And remember, the meaning of a statement in logic is defined by its truth conditions. So this is going to help us know, like, what are we saying when we're saying something is sufficient for something else? And how might the world be that would go against what that's saying? So this is where I bring in something that's a little different from the book. Um, so the first part of the method, the way I'm teaching this, is to translate the hypothesis into formal logic. We know how to handle this because of that clever old sun principle, right? The antecedent or first part of a conditional is a sufficient condition for the consequent or the second part. And the consequent, or second part, is a necessary condition for the antecedent. So if a candidate is sufficient for a target, if that's the hypothesis we're testing, the candidate's got to go in the sufficient condition spot. So that's going to look like this. Candidate, horseshoe, target. Yeah, we don't need these. Okay. That's what it's going to look like. And... Because we know the truth table for a conditional, we know 
there's only one case in which a conditional is false. In fact, let me pull up that little thing that we had before. See, as you can see here with the conditional, only one false case. When the first part's true, second part's false, that's the only time this is false. Any other case, it's going to be true. So if we're trying to figure out how would this thing maybe fail, how would this claim or hypothesis ever get violated or disconfirmed by our evidence, it's going to be the case when this is true and this part's false. And my encouragement is, so like here, let's, you, I'll do it the kind of way I had it when we were doing this before, right? Under these cases, that's the case when the conditional is false. So actually, I want to use a different shape here. This scenario right there is a counterexample. Oops. This is a counterexample um, right here for this original hypothesis being true. So the SCT, it's a test, right? Um, is the candidate really sufficient for the target? Well, not if this is going on, right? If I ever have a case, the way we, we use this is if there's ever a case where the candidate is present and the target is not, then I know that this thing failed the test. Okay, just like when we're doing validity, we're testing arguments for validity, we're putting them up against a bar, we're running them through a gauntlet and seeing whether they survive or not. And if there's even one counterexample, then we know that doesn't hold. And this is this should this might be hopefully intuitive to you that if I wanted to say watering the plants is sufficient for them to grow, like all it takes in order for the plants to grow is to give them water then I should never see a case where I water the plants and they don't grow. If that happened, then I'd know watering the plants is not all it takes to get the plants to grow. Right? That's why this serves as, as the counterexample for claims about something being a sufficient condition. Okay, so if we went through our set of cases here, uh, does A pass the SCT? And the answer is yes. Because I never have a case where the candidate is present and the target is not. So in here, when when and I, I think this is really the good language to be thinking with. Um, if we're saying it's true, that means the condition is present. And if we're saying false, we're saying the condition is absent. Right? That that language is going to be helpful when you're talking about a problem like this one like one of these word problems because uh, like we say the monitor can be old or new well a case of the old monitor is a case where you don't have the new monitor right the new monitor condition is absent uh, but the old monitor condition is present here in case one um, a case of the computer working is a case of it not failing right so the fails condition is absent here uh, and the works condition is present I think that language is going to serve you the best from my experience working through this unit with students. That's what's made the most sense to students. So um, that is my advice here of how to understand this. Is it true that the candidate is present? Or is it false that it's present? In other words, it's absent. Okay, so A passes the test. Um, B does not pass the test. We've got a counterexample. And that counterexample is case 2. In case two, we've got the candidate present and the target not present. It's absent, right? Not G. The plants aren't growing. So that means fertilizer isn't sufficient. And one very important point, this always seems to be a point of potential confusion. We wouldn't say that, well, just in case two, the fertilizer was not sufficient. It's actually overall. Right? When I make a claim that this the, the fertilizer is sufficient for getting the plants to grow, I'm talking universally, right? one of these generalized causal principles. And so that should be applying in all of the cases. So I'm looking over all of my data to see whether my hypothesis is consistent with it. And if I've got counterexamples, then it's not consistent. That proves that the fertilizer is not a sufficient condition for getting the plants to grow. Singing is doing okay, 
no counterexamples there. Um, every time the candidate is present, so is the target. I never have this counterexample where I'm singing, but the plants aren't growing. So, so far, so good for singing, right? Now, there could be another case later where all I do is sing to the plants and they don't grow, and then that would disprove it. But given the data I've got, so far, it's passing. Skittles is not passing. Uh, case two is, again, the counterexample here. Here, this, I put Skittles in the ground and no growing. So that disproves that putting the Skittles is sufficient for the plants to grow. So that's how this is going to work. And, and at this point, you can kind of tell why the SCT and NCT are fallible inductive forms of reasoning, why they're not conclusive proofs. I am able to conclusively prove that something fails. <laughs> I can do that, right? I know the fertilizer is definitely not sufficient for the plants to grow because of case two. But I can never confirm this hypothesis with certainty. I can reject it with certainty, but I can't confirm it with certainty using this test. There's always the possibility some other case is going to show up that serves as a counterexample. And I, until I, it's like I'm ignorant of all the cases, right? I don't have all the information. I just have the information I got. Um, and even in cases one, two, and three, whatever these are, like these gardens, I'm not tracking all the variables. Things could be more complicated than just the variables I am tracking for. So all those things make this um, a fallible form of coming to knowledge, but really the best we got. There's, there's nothing better to work with here. Understanding the world and how it actually is is always going to kind of work like this. Okay, so that's the SCT. And the NCT is going to be basically more of the same. It's going to be the exact same kind of situation here. Um, let me move all of this over here for a second. Make sure we're not losing it completely because I'll, I'll bring it back later. But let's clear up some space for us to work on NCT now. All right. And it's going to, it's going to be the same kind of game, except now the pattern is just going to be slightly different. Um, so let's keep my same formatting here, NCT. All right, and now we're testing for a hypothesis that takes the form uh, the candidate is necessary for some target. Okay, now that's what we're looking for. And just like before, we can use the sun principle here to figure out uh, how this would look if we were doing this in formal logic. And it's going to look like this. If the candidate now we're thinking about is being necessary, then it's going to go in the necessary condition spot. So we will have something like um, target candidate. Right? The candidate's going to go in that necessary condition spot. And again, if we can remember uh, what's going on here with uh, when is when is this whole statement a false statement? Well, it's when the first part's true and the second part's false. So that serves to define what our counterexample is for uh, necessary condition claims when we have claims of this form. So now I'm looking at a different set of counterexamples. Um, let's. Uh, this is really like doing Mad Libs or something, right? Like, so let's see, uh, is A necessary for G? Well, we're going to put A here in the candidate spot and G here in the the uh, target spot. So, is there ever a case? Oh, pardon me. Is there ever a case where we've got the target, the target is present, but the candidate isn't? And at least so far, looking at this data here, A looks to be passing the test. No counterexamples of this form exist. Oh, but their fertilizer failed again. So with fertilizer, we do have a counterexample. It's case three. So in case three, we've got the target present. See, target present. There, G is happening. And the candidate is not present, not B. There's no B there. So this means you can get the plants to grow without the fertilizer, which means... The growing fertilizer is not necessary for the plants to grow. Right? To say fertilizer is necessary is saying you're not going to get the plants to grow without the fertilizer. But hey, that's happening in case two, so that disproves that claim. 
So that, that's the intuitive basis for this counterexample. Um, when I uh, have gone through explaining these, if they haven't quite clicked, go back and just watch that part of the video again. Because it really is as simple as I just said it. It's not anything more complicated than that. Okay? Um, and if that's not working for you, if that description doesn't work, let's talk on the phone. Usually, uh, uh, us just talking it over a couple times is is uh, going to be enough to get you where you need to be. But ultimately, this whole process of using SCT and NCT is very mechanical. Uh, it's not really uh, something that requires judgment calls or background assumptions, unlike everything else that we're doing. This is just plug and chug, right? Do plug in the, for the Mad Libs and compare it against the data and see what you got. Um, so let's uh, let's do all of them. Okay, so if we were going to Oh man, I forget. The webcam is like approximately like right here, I think. That's all the space I've got. Um here. I can I can do this. Let's just make this a little smaller. Is that still legible? I hope it is. <laughs> Let's try that again. Uh, seems like when I resize it multiple times, it gets really goofy. Okay, let's do half and half. Yeah, maybe a little bit more than that. Okay, there we go. Let's just call that good. Okay, I think that's legible enough. All right, so if I was doing this problem on the exam, I'd be asking you for what fails the SCT, and what cases that happens in. Let's actually, let's do this. Fails SCT. And if something does fail, I want to know all of the counterexamples, all the cases that count as a counterexample. So for the SCT, we're again looking at cases, uh, the flip side of it, well, yeah, oh, shoot, we got NCT up here. <laughs> all right. What's this whiteboard? I usually when I do this in class, I got a lot more whiteboard space to work with. So let's do this. Maybe we can pull it back. I can make this a little smaller. Oh my gosh. Okay, give me one second. All right, here we go. So there we got the NCT and SCT here. If if you're using my method of translating these hypotheses into logical form and then remembering the truth table for conditionals, then you can recover these counterexamples whenever you need to. You don't have to memorize them. It's really easy to mix them up. <laughs> like, which one is the one where the target's present, candidate's absent, or candidate present, target absent? It's really easy to mess that up. But if you use the knowledge from Chapter 6 that you got, then you can always recover this for yourself, say, if you're on the exam. You won't need to... Uh, you, can, you can do that on your own power. You don't have to resort to cheating or something like that. Um, so use that. That's a very, very, very useful technique. And the book doesn't mention it, and that's where I think I've got a better idea. Anyway, so if we're using this test now to do this problem, um, I want to know on the exam for these ABCDG ones, which candidates fail the SCT and NCT for a target condition G. And if any of them do fail, I want you to list every counterexample. So in this one, um, A does not fail the SCT. We don't get any of these counterexamples down here. Candidate present, target absent. Uh, with B, we do. B fails in case 2, because there's a case where the candidate is present, the target is not. C is doing okay. D fails. D also fails in case 2. Here, D is present, the candidate is present, and the target is not. Okay, then I'd also want you to tell me what fails the NCT? And if anything fails, what are the counterexamples that rule it out? So uh, here's the counterexample for the NCT. And A is doing okay. No patterns here where the target is present, the candidate is not. B, however, is failing in case 3. Because here's a case where you've got the target, target's present, and you don't have the candidate. Candidate is not present. C is doing okay, no counterexamples there, no cases of no C but you have G, uh, but that's happening with D again. D 
fails also in case 3. So there's a weird parallel here because the B pattern and the D pattern actually are the same. But the case 3 would be a counterexample for D being necessary for G. Target is present, G is present, candidate is not. There you go. So this would be your answer. That's This is how it will look on the exam for these problems. Okay, so that's how we deal with these standard cases. Um, but there's another type of case here that I want to talk about with you. Um, and, and it's this kind of case. Now, oh shoot, I need to pull up the other file actually. Sorry, <laughs> one more pause here. Here we go. I wanted to pull up the other scan from the full book here because I'm assigning you this problem. But there's another one that's very similar to it. And it's, it's this case right here. Um, so it's another word problem. And we've got some data here that's been collected about a number of different circumstances. This is kind of a grisly one because uh, if the setting for this is uh, you host a dinner party and then a bunch of your guests die afterward and you're trying to figure out like what caused their death, like what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for them being dead. So again, just like with doing the ABCDG problems, <clears throat> you got to have a target condition and a candidate condition. Uh, in this, so the, you can't evaluate anything until you've got these identified, right? So the problem tells you that dead, the dead condition, this is the target case. Everything else is a candidate. So it's not soup that's a candidate, it's tomato soup, having the tomato soup. Maybe that was a sufficient or necessary cause for death. Maybe having the leek soup, having the chicken entree, having the fish entree, having the beef entree. We're up to five candidates now. How about white wine, red wine, pie, cake, ice cream? There are ten total candidate conditions here to evaluate for. And the target condition is death. So we'll have to run it through the system. And again, uh, here, let's pull this back up as a refresher. Let's say we're testing for sufficiency. Um, we're looking for counterexamples where the candidate is present, but the target is not. So is tomato soup sufficient for death? No. Because of Anne. Anne's a counterexample. Here you got the tomato soup, but she's not dead. All right, how about leek? Nope, because of Gertrude. Gertrude had the leek soup. She's alive, not dead, right? Target conditions not happening, but the candidate is. Um, chicken, nope. Um, fish, oh, well, okay, that's not a counterexample. Barney's not. Uh, fish, fish, both dead, okay. Oh, oh, Gertrude. Gertrude had the fish. Candidate is present, but didn't die. So the candidate, or the target is, target is not present. So fish is not an, a sufficient condition either. Um, how about beef? Nope, because of Kathy, Doug, those are counterexamples, so on and so forth. Okay, so when you're testing for, the, when you're using the sufficient condition test, you can just look at all the cases where that candidate is present and see whether any of those cases qualify as a case in which the target is not present. Okay, so look at cases where the candidate is present and see if there are any cases where the target is not. When you're testing for the NCT, students always have a tougher time with this. I mean, it's in principle the exact same mechanism, but just there's something, it doesn't quite go right. And in the last couple quarters of teaching this class, I think I've kind of figured out something that at least works. Uh, why this happens, I'm not exactly sure. There, I mean, there's, I got some guesses about it, but at least I've figured out on a solution that often works for students who find NCT just a little less intuitive than SCT. With NCT, you're not looking at cases where the candidate is present anymore. You're looking at cases where it's not present. But don't start there. Start with cases where the target is present. So if I'm testing all of these candidates for whether they're necessary for death, I want to look at the cases where someone died. So Barney, let's look at that case. Let's look at Emily. Let's look at Fred. Let's look at Irma, right? These are all cases where the target condition is present. And then see if the candidate is not present. So is tomato soup necessary for death? No, because here's someone who's dead, Irma's dead, but didn't have the tomato soup. She had the leek soup instead, okay? So tomato soup's not necessary for death. Is the leek soup necessary for death? No, Barney's a counterexample, right? He didn't have the leek soup, but he's still dead. 
that fits with the pattern here. Target condition is present, but the candidate is not. Okay, so that, that might help a little bit here. Let's just do a few more examples. Um, is the chicken uh, necessary for death? Um, no, because of Barney. Barney didn't have the chicken, and yet he's dead. How about fish? Well, Barney is dead. He had the fish. Emily's dead. She had the fish. Fred's dead. He had the fish. Irma's dead. <gasps> she had the fish, too. There, and there's no cases anywhere in our data set where the target condition was present and the candidate was not. So we know fish is necessary for death so far, right? It hasn't been ruled out yet by the data. So that's what you're doing here. Um, when it comes to the word problem uh, on the exam, instead of asking for what fails, I'd be asking for what passes. Um, so your answer will look instead like this. Um, passes SCT and passes NCT. And we had fish, fish passes. And there's no cases to cite because if, if it's passing the NCT, there better not be any counterexamples, right? If there was a counterexample, that would cause it to fail, not pass. So uh, your answer would look like this. Um, incidentally, in this uh, problem, there are none. None of the candidates pass the SCT and fish and red wine both pass the NCT. Um, so that would be the answer here for, um, where is it, for this problem. And now it's on the screen. If you want to kind of work that out for yourself uh, for some more practice, feel free. Um, you don't have access to this electronic version of the textbook, but it, this, will, this should be in your copy of the text if you ordered one. Um, but if not, uh, if you you got a weird different edition, here's the problem here. You can take a look at it for yourself. Pause the video and try it out for yourself. Um, there's one fun little wrinkle, and this is just bonus points. We basically have covered everything necessary here for this lecture. Um, but check out something. Once we make this observation that we can translate these hypotheses into logic, and we know that in logic we can always make more complex statements out of more simple statements, then you can start testing for much more complex uh, hypotheses. For example, nothing's stopping us from testing for jointly sufficient conditions, like this case. Fish and, well, let's do it in formal logic. So fish and red wine, is that sufficient? For death, well, under what? Uh, so we can make a none of them. None of the single conditions were sufficient for death. But what about a jointly sufficient? What if both of these things are happening? Is that sufficient for someone dying? Um, the fact that they're both necessary would be a clue here. Well, in order for this whole statement to be false, we know how uh, conditionals work, right? If we're looking for a counterexample. For the whole thing to be false, the second part of the conditional has to be false, and the first part has to be true. Well, how do you get an AND statement to be true? Both parts have to be true. Like that. So now we know what our counterexample needs to look like. Here, I'll make this a little smaller. Maybe this will work. This is the counterexample. If, if we ever see fish present, red wine present and not dead, that would be a counterexample for fish and red wine being sufficient for death. Does that happen? Let's see. Anyone who has fish and red wine, oh, dead. Fish and red wine, dead. Fish and red wine, dead. Uh, fish white wine, that doesn't count. Fish and red wine, dead. No counterexamples. So actually passing the SCT would include, if we wanted to do it, uh, fish and red wine together, that would be sufficient. Now on the exam, you're not going to have to deal, deal with that goofy stuff. I'm just asking you to test the candidates individually. But what's cool about this, I wanted to just give you a little preview of how this kind of stuff can happen because you can actually use this technique, SCT and NCT, in your everyday life. And it's it's cool. It's a way for you to test things. The pro problem solve, troubleshoot, um, it's it's pretty cool. You you can be a little scientist whenever you want. <laughs> That's why I kind of like the book choosing as an example here, not this goofy one, but 
this case of being at the office, like you're in the IT department and you got a bunch of computers failing, and you're like, okay, well, let me figure out what's what what's the pattern here. Like all, all of a sudden, all these computers are failing on a day. Um, maybe there's some underlying cause of this, and you can diagnose it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, that's it for SCT NCT. Um, let's have uh, the code word tonight just be uh, fish. Uh, that pesky fish, fish and red wine. Fish is the is going to be the code word for tonight. Woo! Fish, fish, fish. Um, here, let's make it make it really obvious here. Fish. There we go. Oh no. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know what's up. Fish is the code word. Uh, that's it for SCT and NCT. Um, if you uh, try out some problems again, see how it feels, uh, and as you try it out for yourself, that's how you'll kind of figure out whether you've got a good understanding or not. So uh, let me know how it goes after that. Feel free to post uh, questions on the uh, discussion board that we have for the 8, 9, 10 unit, and, um, and there you go. Good luck, and I'll see you again on Tuesday.